Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Thank you for coming to another episode of Special Education Advocacy with Ashley Barlow. I'm Ashley Barlow, and I'm so happy you're here. And I'm also happy that Ray Nelson is here. Hi, Ray. Hey, how you doing, Ashley? I'm great. I'm excited to be here. Well, I am so excited to have you. Ray is one of my very favorite advocates one of my very favorite people in special education because Ray is like my kind of people. He says it like it is, he thinks outside the box, he's positive, positive, student-centered. Um, Ray's a special education advocate. Um, and so we're just gonna chat today. We're gonna see where this conversation takes us. Um, Ray, why don't you tell my audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm the dad of a kid with a disability. My son's autistic. Uh, I have two kids. I have an older daughter who also has given me three grandkids, which is nice. Uh, and I have two dogs, two golden retrievers. One's an English American golden mix and one's an English cream golden. She's a puppy. So we're excited about her. Uh, in addition to being an advocate and working what feels like full time at this, I'm also a realtor and I work what feels like full time at that. So <laughs> Um, I would give one up, but I love them both, so I do them both. Um, my interests are pretty varied. I have ADHD, so my main thing, my most consistent interest is music. I play drums in a band. Uh, I play percussion. I, I facilitate and run drum circles. Well, I did before COVID. I will start that again once, you know, numbers are down and it's safe. The hard part is you can't sterilize in native hand drums, right? Like you can't put alcohol on a goat skin because it'll right. um, but, you know, I also like to read, I hike, I camp, I try to get my family to do stuff with me, I play video games, I play golf, both regular and frisbee, I'm terrible at both, but I enjoy it, so, um, you know, I, I'm just a regular guy, I came into this uh, as, you know, my background is not education, like a lot of the folks I meet who are advocates, I, my background is sales, marketing, insurance, lending, it's, it's all finance and business, so, when I got into this, it was a little bit of a challenge to learn to speak the language, but once I learned it, I realized that my negotiation skills carried over, which is, I think, the, the biggest benefit that I bring to the table for my folks is I know, I know I have a pretty good idea of what we can accomplish and what we can't accomplish. And that's- You know what, I say that all the time, that I think my training as, a, as an attorney um, helps me to be able to understand the law Mm -hmm. My training as a teacher helps me to kind of know the ins and outs of the pedagogy, the like hands-on educational piece of this. But sure. truly, it is my collaborative spirit that is just God-given. And then my negotiation training that I got as an attorney, but you could get any other way, yeah. just humans, corporate people, you know, just people can go get um, advocacy negotiation training. I think that's the secret to special education. So it's yeah. interesting to hear you say that because as I just said, you and I vibe so much the way that we work. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's for me, it's figuring out the child's story and telling it to the team in a way that makes them understand what the kid needs. And that's where, you know, I always, it's never one size fits all with me. You know, I, right. I, because they're, the cases are too different and kids need too many different things. And just because two kids have the same couple of disabilities doesn't mean they need the same things. And that's what's hard. And it's interesting, you have the education background too. You see that everything in schools is system-based and everything about IEPs is individualized. So there's naturally a conflict there. Uh, and that can be tough for parents to navigate because a lot of times it's, it's lack of knowledge or you know, sometimes lack of forthrightness by the IEP team, but sometimes it's lack of knowledge by the IEP team. You know, some I get to some schools and the school's like, we, we don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, you don't have a specialist who deals with this. So how would you, you know? You know like, okay, so, so like, and this is what I love about Ray Nelson is I said, tell me what you do. And we're already talking about like 
something super passionate. We're, we're 75 <laughs> layers into the onion. Um, but Ray, I say that all the time. And what I, what I recognize as an advocate for other people is that for me to care, for me to understand somebody's um, perspective, I have to ask my client a lot of questions. And because I'm representing my client and only my client, I ask questions that are one-sided, you know, like, tell me about your child. But my first question is always, what does fill in the blank diagnosis? What does your child's diagnosis look like in your child? What does autism look like in Raymond? What does Down syndrome look like in Jack? What does ADHD look like in Jack? Right. And so I put kind of that um, lens on then all of the decision making, right? And I think that's a huge key as you were just talking about is that parents don't oftentimes communicate that stuff because they just kind of assume, oh, the school knows my kid. The school right. should know right. ADHD or whatever. But so much of it is just communication with that empathy behind it. Exactly. And understanding that each disability has attendant other challenges, right? Like I have ADHD. So there's a whole executive function piece that schools really still don't understand. And even as parents, it can be difficult to understand how executive function works and what it is. But as growing up with ADHD, I, now that I have the words for it, I have an innate understanding of what that meant for me. It, for me, it meant that I knew what to do when I moved out of my parents' house at age 19, right? I knew I had to pay rent. I knew I had to have a job, right? I knew the basics. But doing those things I knew that I needed to do took me a little while to master on my own. And, you know, that resulted in me being pretty much a terrible employee for a couple of years. But luckily, you know, it was at a time when jobs were plentiful and I wasn't a skilled employee. So I was able to learn a lot in the meantime. And I was able to finally find a career track that I liked um, because I, I was fortunate enough to have some good mentors. And, right. and that's not true of everyone. And especially in today's employment world, it is very different. It is very, it is much more rigid and much more structured, which I think is, is good in a way. But I also think that a lot of good people, especially people who have different disabilities, don't even get looked at because their piece of paper doesn't match up. And I think of that. I think about that for you know the the clients of mine that are going to graduate soon. And I'm like, okay, this kid might not interview well, but she's brilliant. So she would do extremely well at this job. But will she ever be able to get it? You know that like that's. Especially if an interview doesn't, especially if the job doesn't involve the people skills that the interview does, that's always complicated for me. Um, but I think, you know, that empathetic collaboration, that real kind of storytelling piece of it is something that you are so good at. So why don't you tell everybody about your advocacy business? Okay, sure. So um, I'll tell you how I got into it because I this is my best story, I think. Um, it's in my book too, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. So when we sat down at my son's first IEP meeting, I think he was four and it was for pre-K and I was fired up and it was my first like conflicting, like IEP meeting with conflict, right? And uh, I'd, I just read Pete Wright's book, Wright's Law, and I hadn't attended the conference yet, but I devoured the book because it gave me everything I wanted to know. And, as, and I sat down, as soon as I sat down at the table, I threw the copy of the book down and, then like, and I made sure that it made a loud noise, right? Like it's all about the affect. And uh, once I sat down and I watched people around the table, I thought, wait a minute, this feels familiar. Oh, this is a negotiation. And the first thing I thought when that clicked was, man, I'm gonna do great at this. My son's gonna get everything because I am a great negotiator. And then my second thought was, oh my God, this is a terrible system because most people do not work on this skill or understand it or, or are able to use it in any way other than the sort of basic, you know, start at the high number, start at the low number, meet in the middle sort of negotiation, that positional negotiation. So, you know, that sort of grew into Raymond's IEP, kept getting more and more services and more and more supports as we learned what to ask for. And our friends were like, how'd you get that? And I'm like, I don't know. I just asked for it. And then I said, this is why. And my, you know, I was, it was my, I, I had a lending background at that point. I was in insurance and lending. And if you're going to get a loan approved, if you're going to insure someone, especially a business, which is what I did, you have to prove that they're a good risk. So I understood the data piece from my business background. And I was able to make that case, which I think a lot of parents, if you're not in an industry that forces you to do that, it's hard to do that. Oh um, my gosh, that's so amazing. <laughs> And like, I just had this huge epiphany that 
because I just do this naturally, but yeah. parents in special education don't work on the skill of negotiation and yeah. that, nor do teachers. Nobody yeah. on an IEP team works on the skill of negotiation, teamwork, collaboration. That's one of the reasons that the system fails so often. Well, and it also, it's confounded a little bit, in my opinion, by, you know, you have central office administrators that often will come in and make decisions about the child without watching the child or observing the child in class, without even, and, and this is a lot of my big frustration, and this is why I rarely, if ever, attack teachers. Um, teachers generally are asking for things behind the scenes that parents don't know about. Right. And parents can't, they can't tell parents that without, because the worry is that the parents will break that trust and tell the school, and then the teacher could lose their job because they don't have whistleblower protections, at least here in Virginia, none of the, none of the schools have any sort of whistleblower for protections. You know, we're, we're just able to have teachers unions here, which is sort of a mixed bag. There are good things about it. There are bad things about it. Um, but at least with a teacher's union, teachers could advocate more strongly for students with less fear of losing their job. And, and that's, you know, I, I know this because teachers have come to me, you know, in confidence and said, look, you can never tell anybody this. And, and of course I reassure them by saying, well, I have ADHD, so I forget everything anyway. So <laughs> don't worry, you know, <laughs> if, if I'm called to court and asked about it, there's a good chance I won't remember because that's just who I am. Um, but also, you know, keeping that trust shows teachers that I'm serious about the education of the kids. I'm not there to grandstand. I don't want to create conflict. My goal is always to create a team that the parents have control over, not 100% control, but I do think that parents are minimized right now and they need a larger voice at the table than they have a lot of times. Oh, for sure. And I agree with you entirely as well, but it's interesting. I was just working on my content for next week, which by the way is like super weird because I usually do it on Sunday night or sometimes even Monday morning. Um, but I was looking at the purpose of an idea and I was doing it for a case. And then I was like, oh, this would be really great content. Um, so, you know, the purpose of, you know, they state like, whereas we as Congress have identified all of these issues that exist in special education. And of course, I'm looking at the current law. So they were saying since IDEA was established in the 70s, we've had 30 years of data. And right. now this is how we're going to look at it as we reauthorize it. And what was interesting was they um, said parents have rules, or I'm sorry, rights and responsibilities. Right. And, you know, I had Pete right on the podcast not too long ago, and Pete was talking about this line of cases where um, that say basically, well, the parent had the right to, to ask for such and such, he had several opportunities and didn't, and so we're going to rule in favor of the school. Um, and so I agree with you that Yes, parents are very underutilized and sometimes not respected like they should be, et cetera. But then there's also the obligation to get involved and to advocate and to be an active team member on that IEP team too. So there is just like everything else in life, there's a, a give and a take, yin and a yang, right? Well, absolutely. And yeah, that's that's sort of what goes back to you know, when I started advocating for other families, they did it for free because I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, I knew enough to negotiate, but I didn't, you know, people were asking me to help and I started, started discovering, okay, these kids are impacted differently. Even though most of my early cases were other kids that were autistic, they are, they're autistic differently, right? It's no kid is autistic in the same way as any other kid. Um, and, and it looks very different from person to person. That's why I stay away from phrases like high and low functioning, because how do you measure function? There's no definition. And, right. and one function could be off the charts high and one function could be almost non-existent. So you can't, you can't, like, the, adult, the adult autistics like, you know, sidetrack again, welcome, welcome to ADHD. Um, but the adults seem to like the phrase high need and low need. And I think that makes a lot more sense because it's, because it, even if you're low need, it, you still have needs, you know, like even if you can function most of the day in a work environment, like a typical office environment, you might need your lunch hour to go decompress and settle your sensory system down. You might not be able to work through your desk at lunch, which should be problematic in a culture where everybody eats lunch at their desk and works through it, you know, yeah. and, but, I mean, it's I mean, a terrible think, culture anyway, but you know. It's, and, and I think the point, it, you know, just this discussion tells us that why do we have to label, right? Like, why do we have to come up with a two 
word pithy phrase to describe how autism impacts us. Like I much prefer to say, um, this child is impacted by autism, blah, 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 blah as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and that's more accurate picture of the, of the child, I think. Yeah, like if you went to work as a, um, a, a typical person that has ADHD and you said, this is what I'm going to need at work, you wouldn't go in with a two word phrase. You would <laughs> schedule an appointment with your manager and somebody from HR to say, okay, I have ADHD. This is what it looks like. And if I'm going to succeed in this job, I am going to need the following accommodations. And it would be an hour long discussion. We don't have to boil it down to a two word description of everything you need right right well and honestly i was i was doing that before i ever knew i had adhd right like I, you know i grew up in the 80s like 70s and 80s so it wasn't a thing when i was in school i was just labeled a bad kid with potential right like because i was smart so i would never do homework because i didn't have anything left at the end of the school day but i always got a's on my tests so you know i passed with c's right <laughs> that was my that was my education plan that was all i had and then in the 90s, things started coming out. And I was like, I, you know, I'd take the quizzes in the newspaper. And I'm like, oh, I'm yes on all these. I probably have that. And of course, half my friends do too, because we were all getting in trouble together. And, um, and then, you know, I, I start working and I realized that I could be a very productive worker, but I needed to work things around. I remember I was in, I was doing lending. I was a loan officer and, you know, we have goals. So I went to my manager and I'm like, hey, I'd like to work four tens. And I think I could do more, do better work there and increase my production. And he said, okay, we'll try it for a month. And so I did it for a month and then I came in to see him and he's like, well, we're going to have to stop doing this. And I'm like, why? And he said, well, you know, everybody else is complaining. I said, yeah, but I didn't do this for everybody else. And they're not the ones responsible for my goal. I was like, why don't we look at my numbers? And he's like, you've tripled your numbers. I was like, yeah, you still want me to change back? And he was like, no, do whatever you want. Right? Like, like that's part of the reason I've drawn to sales is because you can write your own ticket if you, if you do the work well. And, and I think what people get lost in the disability side is that a lot of kids and adults with disabilities do a lot of things really well. You know, there's yeah. no point in focusing on the negative side when there are so many positives. That's exactly it. And I mean, really, that's, I'm glad you ran it to that parallel because that's what I was going to say is, I mean, that's exactly what we do in special education is we try and we, we use a lot of trial and error and we mm -hmm. say, well, I think this might work. What do you think? And um, we try things and then we look at the data to make decisions about how to move in the future. And it shouldn't be this fight. It shouldn't be a something that's set in stone either. I mean, it should be something that is fluid and really is um, student centered, just like your work experience. Well, so I, I, have, I have a question about your practice and that is, do you have a favorite kind of work like what really kind of drives the bus for you what's your what's your dream case so i i've actually had a couple of dream cases recently i i like complicated cases um and not just because i can charge more because sometimes in the more complicated cases i i have a community fund that i use to help folks and if it's like a single mom or, or somebody who doesn't have a lot of money i will dip into that in a heartbeat to help people help their kid right like that is not a big deal to me at all. That's but awesome. I like the complicated cases too, because I have a couple kids that have really rare disabilities. And when I say rare, I mean like maybe 80 to 200 in the United States, right? Like have this particular constellation. And so I like solving the problem for with the parents because a lot of times they're not sure what to do because the, it seems like the rarer the disability, the less creative people are willing to get with it. And sometimes it's a matter of, well, this works for this disability and this works for this disability. So what in common between these two theories will work? And can we try that? You know, so I like, I, I'm really, I read quickly. I learn quickly. I take things in and retain, retain them quickly. So I like cases that make me read a lot and research a lot. And honestly, with a case that's that complicated, school districts know that those are the cases that they pay big settlements to. So a lot of times they will come to the table and be more willing to try things um, and now you have to, you know, you, you still have to do the work, right? You still have to document things. You have to document where they failed. You have to find the procedural violations. You have to tie them to where they have failed to provide an education for the kid. But a lot of times, you know, I always prepare for the worst, but I hope for the best. And so I, I want to be ready if I have to file an action. But 
that's never my goal. You know, yeah. my goal is, is to solve the problem by putting the parents back in control of the team. And, and a lot of times that's rebuilding trust. Mm -hmm. And trust is a hard thing to rebuild once it's been yeah. lost. You know, you know that? That, that, I actually like that too. I like it when a mom calls me and she's like, but then, and then, and then, and then, and she like keeps layering on the things um, because I feel like I can kind of boil it down to something that is more simple. And I agree with you that you, when you boil it down, you get really deep into the research. You, the file review turns up so much. I like to make this like cloud of uncertainty far more certain with best practices and evaluation of the data and um, experts and that kind of thing. And I think from a legal perspective, what we say, um, or what my mentors always taught me was to write the jury instructions before um, you file the complaint. So prepare for what do I have to prove? The jury instructions say, if this, then guilty, um, if it's a criminal case, or if this, then liable, if it's a civil case. And so look to see what you have to prove, and right. then apply the facts of the case to it, and look to see if the facts plug into that at all. And if not, then, you know, and this is where negotiation comes in. Right. If not, or if something's fuzzy or blurry or not particularly perfect, then what you do is you say, okay, well, how can I think outside the box, not to lie or to find a loophole or something like that, but okay, well then in this area of gray mm -hmm. between, you know, there's always something that's reasonable, like a reasonable area, then what matches up for this particular child? How do we think outside the box to get something done, right? Yes. And the creative part, I think, is really critical to solving a lot of these. And, and I call them problems just because I'm a plain speaking person, right? Like I don't, I don't have to call them issues or challenges or candy coat it. I mean, a lot of times there are severe problems in these cases and yeah. the schools know it and changing the language doesn't make the problem go away. But I find too that thinking creatively about this stuff and, and even thinking creatively about the team itself sometimes, you know, I've had clients switch schools, not because the school was not capable of doing what was necessary, but because the relationship couldn't be salvaged. Right. There had to be a fresh start. And sometimes there are personality conflicts and not just with the parents. I mean, sometimes the kids have personality conflicts at schools. Right. I mean, it's not they are right. people, too. And I think that gets taken out of the equation a lot, especially when you look at, oh, well, you know, he didn't he didn't follow the code of conduct. And I'm like, well, but he didn't follow the code of conduct because this, this, this and this happened. And this, this, this and this are on you, the school, because you didn't stop it. And it's the IEP that you're supposed to stop it. So I, I think sometimes right. you do it with a trigger. Oh my gosh, I say it all the time. Like the the ninety percent of cases, they're irritated with the aid because the aid or the teacher has triggered the child, and then the child ends up in some kind of restraint and gets hurt or something. And I'm like, Those are the do you know words. what he said? Do you know what he said? And like sometimes it takes so much self control for me to not. Like say, you know, they'll say, well, he called the teacher a, a beep. And I'm like, oh, was she being a beep? <laughs> I, was at a I was at a disciplinary review meeting and um, the principal of the school, you know, we're at the central office and the principal of the school had created a binder of the, all the things this kid had done, all the disciplinary actions. And then he read off the insults and I'm like trying not to laugh. And I'm like, you know, it was hard. I'm like, Cause this kid was funny, you know, like he, like he know. had a way with words, right? Like, I'm like, I'm like, this does not make you sound great. And it doesn't like, it doesn't make him sound any worse. He still just sounds like a kid, right? Like, you know, and, yeah. Like, I, like, I, that happened to me last week. <laughs> yeah, like, well, and the best part was I like it, when he was done with this presentation, I was like, you know, thank you for this. I was like, I was going to have to put all this together myself, but you put it into a nice little document for me. I appreciate that. Right. Right. <laughs> so I, I mean, Yes, I have laughed too. And then I walk out and I can't wait to tell the parents how, how much self-control I used because I was thinking, man, your kid's very creative. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it, this is what I preach here at Ashley Barlow Company. And I just love your take on that. Um, and I'm so excited because you have something that is like the Ray Nelson, literally the book of Ray Nelson. Yeah, that's, Tell us yeah. about your recent project. So I, uh, I wrote this, I started it in November. It's called Easy IEPs, A Simple System for Improving Your Child's Education. And I, I started writing it sort of as something to give away to potential clients or, you know, just sort of a helpful handbook full of tips. 
And I was thinking five to 10,000 words, something sort of light. And as I started writing, things just started pouring out of me. And, and at about the 10,000 word mark, I was only, I wasn't even, I was about halfway done. I was like, this is going to be a lot more than I thought it would be. So why don't I just turn this into something that parents can actually use? I have a lot of tools that I developed. I, I say myself, but it's all community knowledge. You know, a lot of the tools that I use are tools that I've borrowed or tweaked from other advocates and other organizations. Uh, and, and, you know, Pete Wright, speaking to Pete earlier, Wright's Law taught me a lot about how to make data arguments, but also how is he, Pete's really good at reinforcing the idea that these are people and they have a story. And if you tell the story right, you can't help but succeed. And, and I think when I started looking at the book from that perspective, I was like, okay, well, why don't I write a longer book and make it into a system? And then I could sort of build some classes to help people work through the steps because you know, it's, I think, I don't know, 14 chapters or so, but it's got homework that helps you dig into the case and make sure, like the biggest challenge I have with IEPs is that the document is not designed to flow, right? Like, so you write a goal. Nowhere in the document does the goal break out right over to what should support the goal, right? Like it's, it tells you like a lot of states or counties have sort of, well, you know, this is the person responsible for it, and this is how often it'll be reported. But it doesn't also say, well, this goal also means this accommodation will be needed. The or, design instruction, and yes. Right, the yeah. service will be needed. And, and those are where the gaps are from what I see. And that's a lot of times for me, when I get a case, it's identifying the gaps. So my feeling is, if I can help parents identify those gaps, maybe schools will get better and advocates will not need as to get involved as much because I know there's a whole bunch of people that could benefit from this knowledge but are not at the point where they need an advocate. And I don't, I don't think you should have to hire an advocate. I, you know, I always joke that I'm trying to work myself out of a job. I don't think you should need an advocate to get a good education for your kid. I think it should be part of what the school does for you. And, but there's, there's got to be a way to take some of the control and put it in the hands of the parents. And yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you entirely. And that's why Ashley Barlow Company exists also. Um, you know, I was thinking about what you just said about kind of the form. So actually, Ohio's form, um, by far the majority of my work is in, well, okay, I, I don't know the statistics. Um, right. Until probably the last 18 months, most of my work was definitely in Kentucky. I have way more Ohio cases now, um, but I've always worked in Kentucky and Ohio because that's where I'm licensed. And Ohio's IEP form does take the present levels and then um, you have to describe the present level for each goal before yeah. you state the goal. And then it does have that specially designed instruction that is um, you know, kind of looked at. But something that bothers me is a lot of times they have to come from a drop down menu. Right. And I don't like the word no. I mean, when, when like, I don't know, in kindergarten or whatever, they say no is a four letter word or whatever that is. I was like, I really took that to heart. And so I just don't like, no, I'm always like, hmm, how could we think about this? Now I've raised children with opinions because I have opinions and I taught them that no is not a good word. And it's become problematic because they push me on things. I'm like, but I'm your mom. <laughs> Just let oh, me no. no is the first step on the path to yes. I mean, that's the way I've always viewed it. And my yeah. mom, as a kid, my mom was like, you're going to be an attorney when you grow up. And I was like, I'm not going to school that long. But yeah, thanks, mom. You know, like, but no. yeah, like, no is always just the, bar the first barrier, right? You, I keep asking. Oh my gosh, Ray Nelson. No is the first stop on the way to yes. Yeah, absolutely. I read that somewhere. I think that's maybe Zig Ziglar said that or something, but yeah, that's like. I, oh, you realtors and Zig Ziglar, you <laughs> love Zig Ziglar in your industry. Well, he's got, a, he's problematic, obviously, because he started in the, in the seventies, but he's got a lot of good advice, you know? Well, yeah. And that kind of Zig Ziglar's work is what you and I are doing. I mean, it's so funny that it's like. Positive thinking kind of focused negotiation yeah that's that's always been the way that i that's that's more successful to me than going in and causing a bunch of problems that you know what i mean like that like there are already problems i want right. to be the guy who solves them if i can well and so solving them before before you just rocked my world with no is the first barrier on the way to yes 
I was going to say that, the, so when I face a no, I'm like, but why can't we do it this way? Well, could we right. document that in the conference summary or the PRO one or prior written notice, whatever you call it. And so I'm always the girl that's like, but do we all agree that this is a good thing, even though it isn't in the drop down? And they say yes. And I'm like, well, how about, how about if we document that someplace? Right. And so, you know, that kind of thinking outside the box, literally the box, the drop down box <laughs> is um, something that I, I'm always encouraging parents to do, you know, just, I call it relentless optimism. Whoa, yeah, that's a good way to think of it. Sure, let's try it. <laughs> hey, well, and, and I, yeah, I'm very optimistic. Like I always, I like, I read a lot and follow a lot of adult autistic advocates on Twitter and on, you know, I, I read their blogs and that sort of assume competence idea is what I always do. And, and schools go the other way. And I think it comes from this model that, this medical model that because you have a disability, you have a ceiling. But you would never say that about a typical child. You would never go, oh, this kid's never gonna make it, right? Like, like or, or if you did, what kind of person are you, right? Like that's, and that's where I think that's sort of the false equivalency that I see a lot in schools. They're like, well, IQ is blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, you used a verbal-based IQ kit test for a nonverbal kid. So you don't know his IQ because you used the wrong measure. So let's think about how he's shown us how smart he is. You know, and, and that's where, once you start, you know, and also let's get, we want an IE, but that's, <laughs> that's another conversation. <laughs> Like I think about that. At least it's two thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, like it's just like um, that's a terrible test. This, this, you know, I, I would never say this to a psychologist, but if you looked at any of my file notes, you'll see I've written garbage on a number of assessments because I'm just like, this is who wrote this? Like this is awful. Right. right. Uh, well, and I mean, I think that's you know that's the key is getting that information into the parents' hands, and that's what you've done with this book. I um. As you know, I started to read it and then IEP season hit and I was like, Ray, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to get you my notes before you're ready to publish. Um, but I have read many, many pieces of it. I've spent a few hours in it. And I just think it's such a beautiful document because take parents start to finish through the actual IEP document and the process of that annual review, etc., but you do it in your plain speaking guy language um, that is really accessible to parents. I have a feeling it would probably be accessible to older self advocates, to um, older students that are ready to start to advocate for themselves. And Ray, when you get it, you know, if I get, I, I have stacks of books. I just love, I'm like you, I just devour information. Um, and if I get one, sometimes though I feel intimidated, you know, I'm, I'm trying to muddle my way through Sally Shea, which, <laughs> hang on, Shea Witz is yeah. apostrophe S, um, first kind of big book on dyslexia. And frankly, it's intimidating me because I want to retain all the information. Right. Um, and your book is the opposite of that. It's, it's not intimidating. It's very... I feel like when I read paragraphs of it that I'm sitting in a room with you having coffee with you and I well, I hope that was your goal. Yes, thank you. That's exactly what I wanted because I this stuff's intimidating enough. It's acronyms out the wazoo. There's specialized language inside of specialized language, right? Like how, I as an advocate, we have to be able to talk like psychologists, educators, administrators. We have to speak a bunch of different specialized languages. And we don't have to know it all, but we have to know where to find it all. And that's sort of what I think about is, okay, maybe I don't know everything, but I can learn what I need to know in this case in under an hour. And that's because I know where to do my research. And I've, you know, that's the skill, that's the skill and experience piece of advocacy. But I think for me, I wanted to make this process less difficult and maybe a little bit more fun because I've been, to my IEP team meetings for my son are great yeah. because I, you know, because they, they're, the expectation is there that we're all there for Raymond. We are firmly in charge. They know that we are happy to listen to everyone at the table and I get honest answers out of my team. And mm -hmm. so we have a good time. And yes, I still record because that's good practice, right? Like 
um, right. but I don't have any intention. I, I record simply because I want an accurate record of the meeting. And if there is a disagreement later, I want to be able to go back and listen to it and see if I took the right thing away or they did. And if yeah. I'm wrong, that's on me, right? Like that's, but it took us a while to get there because for some reason, the hierarchical nature of schools just wants to exclude you if you're not a part of the tribe, right? It's, it's almost tribal in the way that it's us against them. And it shouldn't be us against them because we're all a community. Schools are part of the community. Great. And, you know, my yeah. tech, like, we went to, and I can't talk a lot about it, but we went to mediation with our school district a long, long time ago. And, you know, I said to the folks at the table who are representing the school, I'm like, look, I live in this county. If I sue this school district, I'm taking money out of my own pocket and the pockets of my neighbors. That's not what I want to do here can you solve the problem, right? Like, that's like, like, I don't want to waste school funds on some, I don't want to spend $100,000 on something that could be solved with 10. That's just good management, you know? And, you know, I said in a similar situation, in some way, I feel like I'm here cheerleading for our community. I feel like I am here to say, you can do this. You don't, you don't even have an obligation, by the way, to knock this out of the ballpark. Like right. I put, I put that moral obligation on myself as a parent. You don't have that obligation. Your obligation is clearly defined in the law. We're right. in the Sixth Circuit. This was before Andrew F. But it's so you know we had a higher standard than that kind of rally standard of minimal educational benefit. But we, but it wasn't. You have to you know, knock him out of the ballpark. I appreciate that you're intimidated by this. Um, but really I'm here to tell you that I want to make your district better with this somewhat innovative idea that you've come, that, that you're um, expressing hesitancy about. And I, that strategy did work. It was- uh, It worked very well. Like if you're, if you show that you're supportive of the district, because we're, I mean, we wouldn't be advocates if we didn't believe in education, right? Like, I mean, that's the whole, our goal is that education should be for everyone, not just people without disabilities, right? Education should reach everyone. And just because a kid can't pass his SOLs doesn't mean the kid can't learn anything because A, well, SOLs are the state tests here in Virginia. I'm sure they're called something different in Kentucky and Ohio, but you know, A, that's a stupid measure because tests are designed to tell you what you don't know, not what you know. And B, how can we measure all these kids with the same yardstick anyway, right? Like that's not a great way to assess people. People don't present the same way to the same things. And not even like the same person might not present the same way on different days. I mean, we're people, right? We're, we're variable. Yes. So I yeah. like I, the whole idea of, of norming and standards is, is flawed in a lot of ways. And that's a lot of what I take issue with in my assessments. Um, because, you know, you get assessments back that are inaccurate or, or just weren't the right tests. And, and they'll say, well, the kid is borderline intellectual disability. And I'm like, well, okay, but maybe, but this is a snapshot of where your kid was that day. And yeah. I don't and think that test it, the right test for that. Right. And this kid does not present like this. So maybe the kid, like, you know, the kid's got depression. Maybe the kid's depressed. You'll test lower if you're depressed, right? Or maybe the kid was anxious. You'll test lower if you're anxious. It, it, there's a whole lot of factors that just make testing dicey, right? They're a good indicator, but they're not the gospel. That's the way I always look at it. You know, that's funny that, so I need to write like a, a two-page answer to that question <laughs> of like, how do you test a child with an intellectual disability? Because I, or like kind of an advocacy strategy because I get that question a lot from advocates across the country. And I got one from one of our mutual friends um, a couple of days ago. And I thought, okay, I need to sit down and write that. And then I sat down to write it yesterday. And after four or five interruptions, I was like, I just need to call you. <laughs> yeah, because I, <laughs> I have to answer right. it so often to help friends that right. it is, it's so complicated. It's, and it's not, you know, some of the psychological models that are used in testing just don't bear out in the real world. It's like, okay, you, the, the psychology world has satisfied itself that this is the way things work, but right. 
there's a lot of brain science that shows that that's not the way things work. So why are you ignoring that? You know, well, it's like I will tell you, you know, a few years ago, the NIH released a lot of funds to um, like kind of in the IDD world, I think, mm -hmm. intellectual and, and developmental disabilities world, uh, somehow um, developmental pediatricians and psychologists were able to get a lot of NIH money. I don't really know what the category was, but Cincinnati Children's has a psychologist that is testing, kind of testing IQ test on that exact thing and the preliminary data is showing exactly what you and I are talking about. So I'm really excited. I have no idea what the timeline is, but I'm excited for that to come out when it finally yeah. does. Yeah, it's nice to see these measures questioned, especially in light of the history we know that biases against culture and race and and, and economic situations, right? Like, you know, we know that IQ tests are, are kids with more money score higher, right? Like, <laughs> right. Well, so, and yeah, what, what this psychologist was explaining to me, um, is, and then I want, and then I want to ask what you're doing next, because we did totally get sidetracked, but <laughs> Um, what she was explaining to me about IQ testing, particularly for kids with intellectual disabilities like Down syndrome, which is a field where I, uh, you know, which is a, a, a group of people that I often represent, um, is that the test, let's say that a test is, um, one question is supposed to look at your um, spatial relation concept, right. right? Like your ability to understand spatial relations. So she said she like has a little scene that she puts out and it's like, picture the Fisher Price um, farm. And so you have to put the horse on top of the carriage, but next to the bush. And she said, you know, if I gave that to Jack Barlow, he would get the horse and then he'd be like, where? Next to the carriage on top of the bus. He knows next to on top of, he knows the prepositions, which is the text. But in order to administer the test in a standardized way, she can only say at one time. Well, it's really a three-step direction. Sure. So it's, it's giving you data on this three, the ability to follow a three-step direction as opposed to spatial relationships. Right. And so you're missing out on the data about right. spatial relationships. Right, you're assessing two things when you should be assessing one thing, right? Because the that's where the confounding factor is language, right? If there's a language delay, you're going to score lower on all these tests because multi-step directions, things like executive function are assumed and they aren't, it's like they don't think about how they impact globally and things like executive function are global disorders and issues, right? So that language piece is probably part of the ID, but it, it's also not predictive of how much Jack's going to be able to learn, right? It's not saying right. you, you can't, like, we were told, you know, my son was diagnosed at three and a half at Georgetown University Hospital. They were wonderful people. It was a multidisciplinary team. The neurologist, Dr. Mott, was wonderful. He knew what he was talking about. They, you know, they did two days of four hour testing and then they sat with us for four hours and went over the report. It was a 27 page report, 10 pages of it were recommendations. It was basically a roadmap for the first 10 years of his life. And we would not have been anywhere near as successful as we were if we didn't have a team that did that. But, you know, we knew going in that he was autistic. But when we let, when you see it in paper and you spend four hours talking about it, it's different. And yeah. of course, you know, it's the medical model, it's diagnosis, prognosis, right? Here's the diagnosis, here's what you can expect. So they give you all the things that your kid's never gonna be able to do. And my wife said, is that true? Is he never gonna be able to do that? And I said, you know, honey, they can't predict the future any better than we can. I mean, they're, they don't have a crystal ball, right? They're not psychic. That's not even a real thing, right? Like, so like, right. like what, I was like, why don't we take their roadmap and see if we can improve on it? and see what happens. And sure enough, he beat all of their never do list in like a year, you know, like, I'm like, okay, so we know he can problem solve. Let's help him problem solve. We know, yeah. you know, like it, it's, it, it's finding the strengths and building on them, which is always how people learn, right? We don't learn through our failures. I mean, we can learn from our failures, but by and large research shows that we learn more from our successes. We build habits out of our successes, not our failures. Well, yeah, you, that is very true. Um, and the, there's so much simplicity in that, like, very, very simple breakdown of skill, very, very simple breakdown of every life experience. I just, 
I, that's my, my favorite part of raising Jack is definitely watching my boy's sibling relationship because I know it's different, but I think my favorite part of Jack's life is actually watching him process things that I would take for granted in such a step-by-step beautiful way. And I think there's a lot of ways to then instill that in the advocacy model to actually explain his experience, his life experience in order to achieve better results for him. It's cool. And I know that's how you do it too. You know, it's, it, it goes back to that empathy storytelling um, thing. Yeah, it's and, and it's understanding and it's hard. I mean, you know, I say this all the time. Us parents of kids with disabilities have a heavier workload um, than a lot of parents of neurotypical kids. And I'm not saying that typical parents don't work hard because they do, because being a parent is is a tough job, um, even with the best kid. Right. Like there are always going to be challenges that test you. But yes, there are. <laughs> with, with a kid with a disability, you're also trying to figure out how to help in the in the light of the disability in the in the way that it affects your kid which means that the tools that your parents gave you in my case it was spanking yelling and taking things away those are that was my toolbox starting to parent and um you know we spanked him my wife spanked him once and uh he turned around and said more And our OT said, um, yeah, he wants proprioceptive input. So you're rewarding him every time you spank him. So maybe not, not do that one. And I was like, Ah. okay, well, spank is off the table, right? Now we got to find a replacement for that. And then yelling just made everything worse, which it always does. I mean, it made things worse on my part too. And uh, sensory thing too, probably. Yeah. 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 And then taking things away, he just didn't care, you know? (laughs) So I'm like, well, the toolbox is empty. We got to find new tools. And that's, you know, you, as a, as a kid with a disability, as a parent of a kid with a disability, you've got to learn those new tools and you've got to create those new tools. And they're going to be very specific tools for your kid. You know, they're not going to be like one size fits all. So it's harder from that perspective, but we also have to do a lot of extra work as kids get older that, you know, typical kids would do independently. So. Agree. And, and, you know, I mean, there's so many, um, different personality views, right? There's the Enneagram, there's the Myers-Briggs, there's all those things. Like no two people are ever, no, no two people are the same. So, you know, we're always thinking about disability or, or, and ability. And we're thinking about gender and um, we're thinking about personality. And, and sometimes right. we look at, you know, like I'm an Aries, I don't finish stuff. So like we, you know, there's so many different factors that go into our development and our being Um, that ability should just be one of those beautiful factors that make us really cool, Mm -hmm. um, different people. So what's next for Ray Nelson? Well, so the book comes out June 1st. Um, I didn't print it because I, everybody does eBooks now. And I think this works better as an eBook because then you can print the worksheets, which I have in the back of the book. Uh, But I'm actually going to build some video courses to, to pair up with this. Uh, I'm going to, I'm working on those now. I hope to release the first one or two in June. I want to try and get a couple of months out and then eventually bundle them together. But I feel like the worksheets I created and the path I created for parents to go through on this, it could be a lot of work, but I think it's time well spent. And I think the parents who go through this book and do the work will have a lot more understanding about not just what they can do at home to help their kid, but what they can ask the school to do. And, and that's where a lot of, I, I see a lot of the breakdown with parents is like, well, I want, you know, like, for example, I, I've had this one several times, but we want our para to be a man. And I'm like, well, you, you can't ask for that. And I was, I was like, well, hold on, you can ask for it, but they're never going to give it to you. Right. And they're like, why not? And I'm like, well, you can't make personnel decisions for the school, right? That's well beyond the scope of the IEP. That's, and I didn't, you know, I just know that from being in commercial insurance, right? Like that's the employer's responsibility to provide staff. I was like, they're not gonna let you make employment decisions for them because what if they can't hire a male para? All of a sudden they have violated the IEP through no fault of their own. And they're like, we didn't think of it that way. And I was like, now you can ask them informally if they have a male para, if that person could be assigned to your case. I was like, but that can't be the linchpin, you know? Like you can get the one-to-one but you don't get to dictate who it is. And so, so stuff like that, I think is, is important, but yeah, I mean, part of what I'm trying to do is, you know, I do so much advocacy, one-to-one direct advocacy, and I'm less expensive than 
almost everybody in my area because uh, I'm in Northern Virginia. So prices about for everything are high here, right? Yes. And I try to keep my prices low because I'm a special I'm a parent, parent of a kid with a disability, right? Like I don't want, I know how much money I have to spend extra on top of regular kid money yeah. to make things work for my son, right? There are extra co-pays, there's medication, there's a whole kind, there's all kinds of stuff. All that, the brand specificity. You can't just go to Target and oh buy God. a Target brand. <laughs> right, exactly. The food choices, right? Like it's, 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 it's the, the trains. Oh my God, the trains. <laughs> oh my gosh that's so funny you that's like the the total stereotype and you had to buy trains it is he's crazy about thomas the tank engine he's now we did get him to like it's he has an ho scale set now so we're building we're doing cool like creative stuff now like we're creating sets for his trains and oh, like cool. that's really fun so that's yeah, a cool so you're taking it to the next level that's yeah awesome. Um, Ray, you are such a light. You, your wisdom is so appreciated and needed in this field. Mm-hmm. I am so grateful for you joining us. Where can people buy the book on June 1st? Uh, Amazon. If you search easy IEPs, Ray Nelson, it should come up. Um, and I'll send you a link if you want to post it with, where, with on the YouTube with the video. Um, and then my website, nelsonadvocacy.com, I'll have a link to it there. I'm actually getting that redesigned here, hopefully shortly, because I did it myself and I hate it. So. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, Ray. Thanks, Ashley.